you. Yep, my name is Ruffin, and uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, enabling repeatable, reproducible, and deployable software, uh, robotic software, uh, via Linux containers. Um, and so, if you've been following uh, the latest issue of, say, robotics automation, or maybe computing way back in 2007, uh, you've been seeing that these uh, projects of kind of making uh, repeatable research or code bases easier, either through IPython notebooks or uh, for Linux containers, uh, have, have just been kind of accumulating. And so, there's there's a lot of people talking uh, about these topics. And so, here I've just listed a few citations of uh, um, some of the articles about uh, this. And so, um, who has uh, who has used a Linux container? Um, do people know what Linux containers are? All right, uh, roughly like 10%. Uh, for the non-initiated, um, I'm a uh, double E, so I'm not a complete software engineer, but how I uh, interpret Linux containers is uh, they're somewhat on the spectrum of uh, virtual machines and um, running the code uh, bare metal. And so uh, Linux containers kind of share a lot of nice properties with virtual machines in that um, your namespaces are isolated and you have a portable environment, um, but they have some slight differences in that um, they don't have a hypervisor. Um, to do the memory and process management. Uh, you utilize the kernel's resources directly, and so you can get bare metal performance, which is really nice. And that uh, the Linux containers that you're constructing, um, they're built on sort of a hierarchical structure. So uh, just like how we do with Git and revision control, um, you can stack changes in the same way we can, we can treat the file system as sort of this uh, uh, branching phenomenon. And then that's really nice for uh, um, evaluating differences between uh, containers or uh, monitoring the progress of the changes. Um, and this project has, has, been, uh, has been attracted um, so much attention that this has like, started its own initiative called the Open Container Initiative. And so it is getting a lot of sponsors, uh, either from uh, Intel and Red Hat. And so um, the code base is just going to grow and mature. And so it's really something that we can, I think as roboticists, we can build off of. And so um, we use roboticists, we use a lot of open source software. And I see there's a lot of similarities in between us and sort of the web development community in that we're just, you know, wrangling thousands of cats um, around the, the computer ecosystem. And we're trying to make uh, uh, deployable applications, and that um, the Linux container um, revolution that's kind of come up in the web development community, um, we can we can really utilize. And so, um, with with Ross, we have we have a long history of of different distros. Um, the the progress that we made since uh, 2010 has has been really remarkable. Um, but as roboticists, we we not just do with software. We 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 use different hardware drivers, different peripherals, uh, different modalities of sensing and acquiring data from, from our real world. Um, and along with those, we, we have a host of different platforms and um, uh, from different big, small, flying, uh, floating, uh, they use electrics or engines. And so uh, wrangling all that is, is really quite challenging. Um, and so this is uh, playing back to uh, a talk given at uh, Ross Uni or, uh, sorry, a Twitter University talk uh, by one of the founders of the Docker projects. And uh, he goes on to explain this kind of concept of the matrix of hell, where on maybe one axis we have all the different variants of the software components uh, that we're trying to run. In another, we have all the hardware components and targets we're trying to deploy them and execute them on. And getting Every software component running on every hardware component is, is really quite challenging. And then um, for a long time, the software development has just been really too hard and so unnecessarily hard. Um, but for robotics, uh, I'd like to bring up, we kind of have this multi-dimensional matrix of hell. <laughs> and it just goes up to n dimensions. We'll have uh, distros, platforms, peripherals, um, and then, oops, I, I forgot to mention open source libraries. Where do those go? I can't represent this in 2D. Oh, but there's also operating systems. So there's just, there's just so much complexity. And then um, making something portable, robust, is, is really quite challenging for us as roboticists because we're working, we're not 
just software engineers, we're hardware engineers, and so uh, we, we really don't want to have to um, deal with, with all these complexities. So what, what better way can we do that? Um, well, just, just in the, a little bit of background. Um, so how I got started is uh, as a graduate student, new graduate student in, in my robotics lab, um, I'm dealing with like code bases from uh, older generation students and you know they're graduating and the tribal knowledge is lost and also when you encounter you know research papers it's it's just the literature um, you know people publish code on sort of a best effort basis and maintain that on a best effort uh, so reproducing someone's work is really quite challenging um, another thing is maybe if you're collaborating with lab mates um, the the computational environments change so fast that it's kind of hard to keep up um, maybe if I'm doing a project where I just need to collect a data set, a lab mate has already written, written something that uh, collects ROS bags for me, but in the, over the time span of maybe three weeks, the Debian package has changed. Um, so that's something that I guess uh, the SNAP framework is trying to resolve. Um, but it may be more complicated than that. Maybe it might be a, um, a, a ROS environment variable that was set, particularly on that one robot. And so reproducing that is, is really quite challenging. Um, so how do, I, how do I see that Linux containers can kind of help simplify uh, a lot of this stuff is um, I see this being used for maybe cross-compilation environment setup. So you have some really complicated cross-compilation tool chain and you want to share that with other people. Uh, having someone execute a, a line of scripts might not be suitable for everyone, um, especially maybe if they prefer on working on different distros. Um, another thing is maybe custom dependencies. Uh, maybe you're, for me, I, I, I'm trying to build OmniMapper project, which uses a different version of Eigen because GTSAM is not compliant, and so I have to custom build PCL, and that takes a long time. And um, you know, managing all these custom dependencies is really quite uh, tricky uh, in the share. Also, I see this really applicable for multiple robots. So if we're trying to tackle uh, swarm robotics, um, you know, hand gardening a certain environment on the one robot is, is not going to scale. Um, we, need, uh, we need a better way uh, to, to deploy uh, certain changes or updates across our, our fleet of swarm robots. And that's really quite similar to what DevOps and uh, web developers do is they, they have, you know, this dynamic cluster of, of engines uh, for either their HTML services, and they really want to um, uh, distribute the changes or uh, web update page updates across that. So we really want to do something quite similar. Um, I'm going to talk about maybe three areas um, that this is maybe particularly uh, of interest to. One is education, research, and industry. All right, and so uh, I have a couple uh, video demonstrations that I can go into. Um, so I'll just start with some of that. Okay. So what I have here is I have some kind of host environment and then maybe this browser that has all my instructions that I'm executing. And so what I've done right here is just like Docker, run, and some interactive, and then specifying ROS Indigo. And what that will do is download and pull the uh, version or image of ROS, and then I have a running ROS environment. And then what I'm doing uh, further is um, I'm cloning some uh, ROS tutorial package, and then this, this image that I've downloaded already has this nice uh, virgin CatKin workspace set up for me. Uh, so then I can just, you know, CatKin build the project. Um, and then uh, what I'm doing after that is uh, I'm committing my, my changes to a new container that I can share and distribute with my colleagues. Um, and then after that, um, once, I've, once I've shared it, maybe then I want to start uh, running it. And so we can leverage uh, networking tools within the Docker framework to spin up separate ROS nodes and separate containers. And so each container can have its own ROS node. And then that way, in the same sense, we can distribute containers across multiple machines. And so if you still want, if you're, you're still comfortable in like using the node framework but want to use multiple machines, uh, multiple masters is somewhat complicated. But in this sense, um, we can create a virtual network layer um, to maybe connect multiple robots on, uh, on a single ROS framework. 
Um, see, then here I'm introspecting the container. So I'm looking at like, you know, when was it committed? Who authored the commit? Were there any commit messages inside of it? Um, everything is hash-based, and so uh, Docker is also including uh, some components where we can authenticate containers. So maybe if you... Uh, um, let's see, let me go back to the educational stuff. So here, uh, when I started getting into ROS, one of the big off-putting stuff is, is just getting to uh, the environment set up where I can run the tutorials. And I think that off-puts a lot of other people. But how I got around it was I, I started using um, a virtual machine. So that someone had, had been taken care, uh, had taken enough care to, to share a virtual machine session with ROS pre-installed that I can download. And in the same sense that I think containers help bootstrap um, kind of coursework where uh, an instructor could, uh, authentic could, could construct an entire container for their coursework. And then that way students can um, fail fast, learn fast. They'll have this kind of disposable work environment that um, they don't, they're not afraid to try different dependencies. They're not afraid of, of hosing their system. Um, because when, it, when, you do, when you destroy a container, you can close it and you can restart a new one. And if you're interested in saving those changes, you can. So it really helps in, in that sense. Here I'm just doing a talker-listener kind of note, uh, framework in, in multiple containers. Um, and then I think later I'd show that like, the process IDs, that they're all on separate containers and stuff like that. All right. All right, for, for research, um, see, maybe you might know that uh, deep learning is kind of a hot topic in computer vision. And so maybe if you want to, if, if I'm a researcher and I want to try different uh, computer vision algorithms, um, it, it takes a lot of time for me to, to iterate through each one. I mean, I, I might succeed in finding one that works just for me. One, I might, you know, it looks really good at first, but I try it out on my, on my application and it's pretty terrible, so it's just a waste of effort. But if I'm spending like, you know, days or weeks trying to re-implement each person's publication, then that's too much time and the iterative cycle is way too long. Uh, but here, uh, let's say if I want to use, uh, test someone's cafe model. Um, here I've just written um, a small ROS node that, uh, um, that's it, here, okay. So I've just written a small ROS node that, that continuously takes a live image stream from an open NI device. This is all running inside the container. So when I mount the container, I'm mounting the NVIDIA device so I can do, uh, I can have the GPU uh, do high speed performance so I keep up with the frame rate of the camera. Um, I've also mounted, I've also exposed the X server so then I can have GUIs such as RViz and Terminator um, inside the container exposed to my host environment. And then um, I have the, the NVIDIA drivers exposed, so, and then as well as some uh, kernel modules. So in, the, in this uh, YouTube video, I, I have a link to, uh, to the code base that, uh, that you can try it. So my, my, my goal is that uh, you could pull down this container, and as, as long as you have the same equivalent NVIDIA driver uh, installed on your system, I think it's CUDA 7.5, whatever the default was there, uh, that you could implement the same thing. Uh, so here you just see you know, it's classifying coffee cups, um, different uh, joy pads, and you know it's like fifty percent sure that's joy pads. So that, that's that's some stock. And then just to show you that this is a live demo, um, it's really sure that's a tiger or a jaguar. Um, this is running on the computer. It's not a Ross bag, so it's it's and it's classifying my own computer as a you know mouse and whatnot. So that's kind of neat. Uh, last uh, industry. So for those who may be interested in doing continuous integration um, where you would uh, really like to improve that stuff, I think uh, Docker with Gazebo offers a lot of tools and maybe providing the same services as Jenkins or Travis where we want these cloud-based uh, continuous integration services where we're scaling up and down simulations as we need. And so here um, I've just started a, a gazebo container, um, then I uh, go into the container, uh, download a double pendulum model, uh, start a simulation, uh, record a certain log file, and then I can introspect that log file 
let's see here, so here's its, there's the log file data. All right, but then because it, the container has exposed the network peripheral, I can also connect a, maybe GZ client to the container. So then uh, my, on my host system, I can have uh, uh, some user interface. And so I've, I've tested stuff uh, using Gazebo Linux containers with AWS, and um, uh, there's a lot of promise, I believe, in, in some of those. It's, it's really quite, quite easy to try different versions of Gazebo 4, 5, and 6 if you want. Um, okay. And what other ways uh, we're using Docker and Ross? Um, we're using it for continuous integration and build farms, and then the second generation build farm for Ross. Um, future ways I see this being used is um, maybe integrating ROS launch with the Docker API so that, you know, ROS launch spins up a new container um, per every ROS node. Um, also connecting it where, uh, just like with Docker, we can point uh, the Docker CLI to a Docker swarm. Uh, we could point maybe a ROS launch to um, a container swarm of, of, of ROS nodes. Um, and so that's also using some of the virtual networking layer. Uh, there's official repos for Ross and Gazebo available, so go ahead and try them out. Uh, they're getting a lot of pulls, I think, as of recently. I think someone's connected their continuous integration to the Ross one. It's over 25,000. Uh, but there's also ones for Gazebo. That's both uh, uh, Ross Indigo and uh, Jade. And then for Gazebo, we have five, six, and seven. Or, um, or then we also have a uh, Gazebo uh, X, which is sort of the latest and greatest kind of uh, default version of uh, what's at the head of the master branch, and also uh, ROS2 uh, example. So if you want to try ROS2 yourself, you can check out the, the state of the ROS2 project. Um, tip of the hat to OSRF and my lab. Um, I really could have done this without with the time I, I had at OSRF to, to kind of polish uh, some of the, the code bases and uh, submitting the official framework to Docker Hub. And so here's some robotic resources and I'd like to open for questions. Um, so, so the question was, how exactly does the, the ROS networking um, uh, uh, it work or collide with sort of this Docker uh, frame of networking? Is that um, if you if you look at uh, some of the, the tutorials or the kind of the documentation I wrote in the official uh, Docker Hub repo, um, I I go through a test case scenario uh, where uh, yeah we're we're trying to split multiple nodes and mul multiple containers and it's really quite transparent. The only thing we need to do when we start up a container is we need, just need to set the environment variable and then and because. Um, the, the Docker networking stuff is still a bit beta, but how it works is we can set a container and define its service, and then on this virtual network that interlinks the containers, the containers find each other based on whatever service you called it. And so if you set the same strings with environment variables, um, you sort of get this sort of uh, the ROS networking scheme where I can have a master running on one machine, but as long as I, when I'm starting nodes in this environment that it's pointing to that master, it's quite transparent. With uh, ROS2, it's really cool because um, you see that with the ROS2 example, I don't need to set those pr parameters, and the service discovery finds the interlink between the two containers automatically. So it's kind of cool to play with. Other questions? Back there. Um, the, the, the question was whether, what are, what are the details on Jenkins with this? Uh, there, there aren't quite any dependencies on Jenkins. It was just sort of an analogy where, um, in the same sense when, when we were using Jenkins and Docker to make a sterile environment to, to build a package, um, we can also use uh, some other continuous integration to start containers to start the simulation. Um, so that way, you know, if your simulation is environment dependent, you, know, you can have an easy way of tossing up your environment to the to the cloud or to the build farm for this continuous integration for robots. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Docker instead of virtual machine. Yeah. Time for one more question. Or zero more questions. Oh, right. Sounds good. Let's all thank our speaker.